Today I'm going to share with you not only some of what the research supports as being the most efficacious tips for responding differently to pain, but more importantly, the very best tips and tools that have been shared with me by those who are successfully coping with migraine. These are the tips and tools that have been shared with me by those who have their migraines. Their migraines don't have them. I am here to talk to you ladies and gentlemen about the top 10 things that I have learned from your fellow migrainers that have allowed them to get their life back. So the first thing that I've learned from migraine sufferers is self-compassion. So for many migrainers, self-compassion became the ingredient that changed their life. I want to talk to you for a moment about what self-compassion is not. Self-compassion is not feeling sorry for yourself or wallowing in self-pity. It is extending the same kindness to yourself that you so freely and reflexively offer to those that you care for in your life. Self-compassion is also not about comparing yourself to others. So, so often we all get caught in the trap of comparing ourselves to somebody who seems to be doing a little better, who seems to have it a little bit easier. And so this can often make us feel much worse. On the other hand, self-compassion is also not about comparing us, ourselves to people who seem to be not doing quite so well. So this can really diminish our own lived experience, our own suffering. It's about being with whatever is here for us, pain, suffering, with a kindness, the same kindness that we offer to those that we love and care for. So often we make rules for ourselves and sometimes we hold ourselves to unreasonable standards. So some powerful exercises for enhancing self-compassion is noticing shoulds. Just think back, maybe over the course of the last day, of how many times you told yourself that you should be doing something. So you should be doing something better, you should be doing something, um, you should be a better partner, a better parent, a better employee. So we think that these shoulds are gonna motivate us. We think that they're gonna drive us, they're gonna push us. But for most of us, really the experience of telling ourselves that we should be something different than who or what we are becomes demoralizing. And actually that's what the research shows, is that the more we tell ourselves that we should be something other than what we are, we're, we're feeling worse. Um, and so thinking about how you talk to a friend, very often we would never dream of talking to a friend the way we talk to ourselves. We might not even talk to somebody we don't like the way we talk to ourselves. And so really thinking for a minute, how would you talk to somebody that you knew, that you cared about, who was struggling with migraine? Might you say something along the lines of, I care about your suffering. I see that you're struggling. I want you to know that I'm with you in your pain. And so really thinking of what it, it feels like to direct this kindness in work. Another really powerful exercise for cultivating self-compassion is imagining a person that you love and who you really trust loves you. And imagining seeing yourself through their eyes. So what can they see about you that you've forgotten about? Maybe it's your sense of humor. Maybe it's your kindness. Maybe it's your intention to be a loving, caring person. And so just remembering to see yourself in the same way that those who care for you most do. So the second thing I've learned from migraineurs is to decatastrophize. And so it is so normal when you are in intense pain to go to a worst case scenario, to think about all of, all of what could be terrible that can happen right now. And the, the fact of the matter is, 
often these thoughts that come with that kind of intense pain are legitimately terrifying. And so the people that I see who are really on top of managing their response to pain, it's not that they never catastrophize, it's they re that they recognize it for what it is and they've learned to respond differently to that thought. And so these are some examples of catastrophic thoughts that I hear. Um, some of these may look familiar. You may have your own brand of catastrophic thinking that comes up when you're in a lot of pain or when you're anticipating being in a lot of pain. Um, and so what do we know about catastrophic thinking or worst case scenario thinking? We know that it intensifies the possible negative impact of pain. It intensifies helplessness in response to pain. We also know that it results in elevated pain ratings, reduced ability to tolerate pain, and greater disability both through self-report and clinician evaluation. So our ability to respond to pain is reduced in addition to the pain being more intense. <coughs> What you're looking at here is a worksheet. So this is the nuts and bolts of cognitive behavioral therapy. This is a worksheet on decatastrophizing. And so the idea is that catastrophic thoughts are made of two elements. The first is overestimating how bad a negative event will be, and the second is underestimating how much control you'll have in dealing with the event. And so the idea is that when you, you first look at how bad the event will be, and you list the thoughts, the evidence, and I mean cold, hard facts for that being true, and then cold, hard facts for reasons why it's false. And I mean the kind of cold, hard facts that you could only show in a court of law. So these are not thoughts or estimations, they're facts. And then on the other hand, looking at how much control you have over the situation. And so the idea is when you sort of work through this the same way you might work through a math problem, at the end what shakes out is something that may not look like sunshines, rainbows, and butterflies, but it's something you can deal with. It's something that is more grounded in reality and is less terrifying. And this is what people who are managing their response to migraine are, are using and Again, it's not that they're not having catastrophic thoughts. They're identifying it and then working with it. Number three, the antidote to fight, flight, freeze. So pain and fear travel together. They're like best friends. We know that uh, part of the pain network activates the fear response in the brain. So our brain has evolved to fear pain, to avoid pain, and to remember how to avoid pain. When in pain, the part of our brain associated with fearful emotions goes into overdrive. This is called the amygdala. And the body's survival instinct kicks in, and we're now in a state of stress, which can heighten the experience of pain. So the question becomes, how do we deactivate this fight, flight, freeze? What, what quiets this down? So the really amazing thing is, when I ask people, what do you do when you're in that much pain? Besides take medication, what do you do to help calm yourself? Anyone who is a pet owner will tell me the same thing. They snuggle. They get close. Yeah, they get, they get close with their pet. They snuggle with their cat, their dog. And this is because comfort, connection, care, love, it deactivates that emotional fear response in our bodies. And how do we know this? Because we know about Aww. something called <laughs> oxytocin. Aww. So oxytocin is the body's natural painkiller. It's a hormone that's released in the body to a large extent during childbirth, breastfeeding, intimate partner relations, and to a lesser extent when we're close to the people that we love, when we're feeling connected, when we're feeling a sense of belonging. So number four, sleep. Never underestimate a good night's sleep. Some startling statistics 
In the last 50 years, our sleep on weeknights has dropped from 8.5 hours to just under seven. 30% of employed Americans are getting six hours of sleep a night or less, and 70% of Americans describe their sleep as insufficient. Sleep deprivation results in higher levels of cortisol in the body the next day. Cortisol is the body's stress hormone, so we're more stressed often if we're sleep deprived. Lack of sleep also increases the activity of a gene linked with inflammation. We know now that inflammation and pain go hand in hand. And pain tolerance is decreased when we're sleep deprived. So, so often I see the connection between getting a better night's sleep and managing migraines better, but I also hear that people tell me, you know, when I've had a good night's sleep, I can respond a little bit better to my migraine. I feel like I have more control or I can tolerate it a little bit better. So for, epi for episodic migraine sufferers, two consecutive days of either high stress or low sleep were strongly predictive of headache. Two days of low stress or adequate sleep were protective, and headache activity was highest when high stress and low sleep occurred concurrently during the prior two days, denoting an additive effect. So just some tips on sleep hygiene. Uh, wake up at the same time each day, go to sleep when you're tired, not before. Probably the most important thing is get up if you can't sleep after 15 minutes. So often we spend time in bed tossing and turning, being stressed and frustrated, and what this does is this pairs the experience of being stressed with the bed. And the idea is we want the bed to be paired with sleep and relaxation. And so some of the best behavioral recommendations are after 15 minutes of not being able to sleep, get up, get out of bed, and do something. But don't do something fun. Do something <laughs> that is really mundane, and I don't want to say kind of miserable, but something you know, like reading the dictionary or scrubbing the floor. Because guess what? If it's too fun, you're not going to want to go back to sleep. And if you're reading the dictionary, you may realize just how tired you really are. So, um, again, we want to pair the bed for sleeping and only sleeping. Who has a dictionary in there? No one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so create a buffer zone and a relaxing routine before bed. You know, it's the same thing we do with small children. So, you know, they take their bath, they brush their teeth, you read them a story, you tuck them in. So the body likes this kind of winding down routine. Also, don't worry in bed. If you find yourself worrying in bed, get up, get out of bed. Um, oh, all the obvious stuff, avoiding screens, heavy food, caffeine, and alcohol just before bed. So number five, physical exercise. And I had all of this research on physical exercise and migraine and managing pain, but I decided just to keep it to the basics. So enhance endorphin levels. So again, endorphins are our body's natural pain relievers. And we used to think it took a whole lot of sweating and exertion to release these endorphins, and we know now it doesn't. Um, improved hormone regulation, we know that many migraines are related to hormones, and so anything that can be done to improve hormone regulation is gonna help with the migraines. Decreased inflammation, there's a strong antidepressant effect. There's lots of research now coming out on how powerful regular exercise can be for reducing um, depression. Also to improve self-efficacy and confidence or a person's ability to have a sense of mastering their own health. And so this is probably what I see most. People are feeling really empowered. They're starting to exercise. They feel like they have some control over their health, their body, and they're exhilarated by it. Um, reduced muscle tension certainly can be helpful with managing migraines overall. And there's some evidence that exercise makes for a, st a smaller stress response to psychological stress. Number six, social support. So this is something that came across my desk recently. How many people could you count on in your life in a true emergency? A, zero, B, one, C, two to three, D, three to five, D, e, five to seven, or F, eight or more. And so we think that social support can be large or small. It just requires a sense that you can turn to them if needed. 
And so we think of two different types of social support. So one is the kind of social support where you're going to be able to reach out to them or ask them for a favor if need be. And the other kind of social support is the kind of social support, this is the friend that you can call when you're having a bad day, who will just be there and listen. And so we think it's really a combination. The health benefits are probably derived not from a single encounter or relationship, but are cumulative. For patients with chronic migraine and medication overuse headaches, psychosocial factors, which include the perceived social support, accounted for about 25% of disability and reduced quality of life. So I can tell you anecdotally that for the people that I see, you know, if you have two people who have same migraine intensity and frequency, and one person has really good social support and one person doesn't, the person who has the good social support is going to, they're going to feel better, they're going to be protected from things like depression, and they also may be living their life in a way that feels more meaningful to them. So this can be a really powerful um, element. So just thinking for yourself, when was the last time you spent time doing something fun with a friend or a family member? And what do you do for fun? Um, so, you know, maybe you enjoy doing solitary activities like reading books. Well, in all likelihood, there's probably somebody else in your area who enjoys reading. And so something like a book club gives you the option of doing the thing that you enjoy while having some social interaction. And so just thinking about how to enhance your social support. So giving a call to an old friend, sometimes we underestimate how powerful this can be in improving our mood and the mood of the person on the other end of the phone. Um, having a friend over for dinner or tea, so not necessarily having to make a big production. And if your house isn't tidy, going out to meet a friend for a coffee or tea. So just the idea of getting together with someone and having that connection. Even something as simple as going with, for a walk with a friend or a family member can be really empowering. Number seven. Know your limits and use pacing. Overextending oneself during a stressful task we think could induce headaches in some cases. Um, you know, it's not uncommon for people to engage in kind of a boom-bust pattern of activity. And so what this is, is they have a really good day, they're feeling really energized, and they go to town cleaning the whole house. And then they inevitably crash, and they feel terrible. And what this leads to is a real sense of feeling out of control. And so this can become a pattern, and you can see that over time, this leads to a decrease in activity level. A better option is pacing your activity, which leads to improvement over time. And so the idea is maybe 20 minutes of cleaning and 20 minutes of rest. And so you may be saying to yourself, are you kidding me? It would take me forever to clean my house. But the idea is, is that it's leading to improvement in activity level, and you're not finding um, the sort of crash where, where people begin to feel really out of control. Um, so pacing is about judging when to stop an activity based on time, not on pain. Pacing will give you more control. And the baseline should be used on a good day as well as a bad day. Um, to begin with, you may find it difficult to limit yourself on a good day. This is what most people find. Um, using a baseline leads to improved tolerance and achievement. And taking a break is not a sign of weakness or failure. It's a wise move to allow you to gradually work towards building up your stamina. Eight, transforming suffering into resilience. How will I grow from this? A wise man and a horticulturist once told me that some of the most beautiful flowers on earth only grow in the desert. And so thinking for yourself, how am I growing from this adversity? How have I changed in a positive way because of this? So I get to hear some really amazing things from the people that I work with. You know, one of the things I hear most commonly is people are more compassionate towards themselves or towards others. People may learn that, um, you know, growing up many of us learn 
that it's always important to take, put other people first. And sometimes we wind up so saddled with obligations and responsibilities, we forgot what really mattered most to us. And so people tell me that they're learning to live more authentically than they've ever lived before. And that the migraine has really changed um, how they have been living their life. I also hear about people who become advocates for headache or for other illness. People tell me that they've learned that just because others have needs or wants, um, that, that doesn't, that's not an excuse to put their own needs dead last. Um, I often hear how important uh, relationships are. And so people tell me, you know, I wouldn't have realized what a gem I had in my partner had it not been for these migraines. They've stuck by me through thick and thin. Or I have a friend who, no matter what, is always there. And really recognizing and appreciating these relationships comes out of this migraine experience. I also hear, and I think what sort of strikes me the most, is when people tell me that their whole life they believe that they were valuable because of what they do or what they do for other people. And from the migraine experience, they've learned that it's not what they're doing because, quite honestly, migraine can limit what you do, but it's how they're being with the people that they love. And so that's something that they can still control. They may not be able to go to every family function, but how they are when they're there is what matters most to them. Number nine, find a new purpose or passion. So purpose and passion is not static. Um, so here's a picture of a guy, maybe he ran his whole life, and as he aged, he found that he couldn't quite do the same thing, and he found a new passion for swimming. And so I hear some really cool things about how people have found new passions or senses a sense of purpose. So one woman who was an outstanding <coughs> businesswoman and a sales rep and really passionate about her career had to retire early because of her migraines. And she started taking care of her granddaughter. And at one point she said to me, you know, I've, I've found a kind of fulfillment that I never knew before. And this became a real sense of purpose for her. Um, I worked with a formal, former social worker that found that ministering to the sick in her church fulfilled her need for purpose. And a woman that found that she could still crochet even when her migraines were at their worst and she began crocheting blankets for the homeless. Number 10, find hope in yourself, not just the experts. Those who put all their hope in the experts, the doctors, medicine, or the latest scientific advances are often disappointed. These well-meaning humans and institutions also have limits. Those that do best trust their own body's ability to heal, take positive steps towards self-care, and trust their own ability to cope with their condition in addition to using conventional medicine. And finally, Migraine treatment is best served buffet style. So while many people may be able to gain migraine, migraine control from medication alone, a multidisciplinary approach is recommended for those more severely affected. And I would also argue that you know so much of what we're doing here is about this sort of uh, buffet style. And I think it's not just for those who have more severe migraines, but I think it's for people who really want to have control themselves of their migraine experience. So thank you so much for having me, and I hope this was helpful.